Our final speaker for the evening is Jamila bin Habib. Uh, uh, she's raised in Algeria where her parents were engaged in social and political causes. Um, they had to flee and then went to uh, Paris. Uh, there, she organized groups that fought against the oppression of Algerian women, and some of this oppression I mean, reached as far as France itself. Um, so I'll, I'll allow um, Jamila to come up here and um, talk about what she does. Thank you. Hello, I am uh, Jamila Ben Habib, and I am very happy and honored to be uh, with you today, and also for this opportunity uh, you offered me to share my thoughts uh, about a matter that worries all of us, which is political Islam. My first words are ended for Mayam and her amazing team. I would never thank you enough, uh, not only for having organized this beautiful event, but also for the tremendous efforts you dedicated over the last months to make this great meeting possible. Thank you, Mariam. Uh, also, dear friends, I would uh, ask uh, for your indulgence, since my English is not uh, my first language, and actually this is the first time uh, ever I am delivering a speech in English. <laughs> But I am uh, glad uh, to do uh, so in your nice company. So, dear friends, I warmly thank you in advance for your patience and tolerance. Um, in our times, and this more than ever, we need to talk and to speak. We need to express and to share our views. We need to write and to create. But this need to think freely and to freely express our thoughts is now threatened. First, because of Islamist terrorism, which every day kills many people all around the world. But also because of this terrible censorship, which is targets all those who only want to exercise their free will and to live as a free citizens who are not under the control of religious dogmas. Dear friends, to this regards, we are in a bad shape, but you already knew it, right? I also wish to thank all of you for your uh, persistent belief in these projects and for having responded so warmly to Mariam's call. This is a tangible proof of the moving force we are now building. And this because we are convinced that political Islam is, not, is now a fatality. Yes, we can fight against it, but for fighting in an efficient way, we need to make the right diagnosis and also to make the right decisions and the right strategies. Yes, we are a real force, and it, it's still too modest in front of the huge task that needs to be done. We are a force which is not only willing, but that is also determined to grow. It's up to us, and we absolutely must get here. I am just back from the Avignon Theatre Festival in France, invited by uh, Charlie Hebdo teams to take a part of the festival, where it has been very difficult to find a theater that was willing to allow the expression of the words of Charb, who was uh, Charlie Hebdo's director and who, as you uh, all know, was killed in this uh, sad day of January 70, 2015. It's true 
that the subject exposed in Sharp's work are sensitive, since the play is an adaptation of Sharp's posthume books, which uh, the title is Lettres aux escrocs de l'islamophobie qui font le jeu des racistes, which the translation is a letter to the intellectual who use Islamophobia and play into the hands of racists. Um, but uh, how come we must now in France be overly careful when it's about religion? Can you imagine that it's now difficult, if not dangerous, to laugh, to, to laugh about religion, especially when it's about Islam? And this, my friends, happened in Voltaire's motherland. But uh, determination finally paid off. Five performances of the play were held between July 14 and 19 at the Théâtre de Loul. The room was always full. Uh, the audience and the audience uh, and allowed the audience to exchange views about secularism. And this, this is nothing compared to the tremendous destructive force of political Islam in a Muslim countries, where freedom of thoughts is under attack, if not destroyed. As you know, political Islam has ravaged many Muslim countries, and unfortunately, it has made its way in Western democracies. How come this is so terrible evil can expand here and there, almost everywhere, with such quickness. How has it all begun? Why this awful regression? And this is the symptom of what? How can we explain the complicity of Western governments and also the cowardness of their elites in this story that now concerns all of us? Those are some of questions that worries me for more than 25 years. I mean, since the day my mother land, Algeria, went through some of the darkest pages of its history when an Islamist political party named Front Islamique du Salut and its armed ranks were determined to transform Algeria into an Islamic state like Iran. During those, those times, at the beginning of the 19th, we would have never imagined Algeria would fall into terrorism in such a way. What, where that uh, violence came from? Algeria was the country of all hopes with a real potential for development, but which has failed to prioritize the right things in the right way. Algeria, which is an authoritarian country ruled by a single party regime, terribly lacked democracy. Societal issues were underestimated and the focus was concentrated on economy and social services. Human rights and individual freedom were totally forgotten. Separation of powers between the state and religion, which in the case means separation between the state and Islam, has not been dedicated as a constitutional principle. Freedom of conscience have never been recognized. On the contrary, the Constitution stipulated and still does that Islam is the religion of the state. Is it true, this uh, bridge, that starting from the first days of our national independence, the Islamists penetrated deeply into the Algerian society? They invested mainly two spheres, school and family. Starting in the early 1918, Algerian school, school got Islam, Islamized with teachers who came from some Middle East countries like Egypt or Syria. Actually, many of those teachers were members of the Muslim Brotherhood, whom 
the Baptist regime wanted to get rid of and who got into Algeria thanks to uh, the Arabization policy. All those young people who were trained in those schools of ignorance, hate, and despair have been sacrificed by the regime. Many become themselves killers who were willing to cut all the leaves of the most brilliant amongst our citizens. The second sphere of the Islamist conquest of power was the family. In 1984, Algeria adopted a family code. This code was directly inspired by the Sharia law. It legalized reproduction and polygamy. It also puts the woman under the guardianship of men. It authorizes any husband to correct, to correct his wife. But how one man should correct his wife? That is the question. How long must be the stick? This is how family become the first laboratory of violence. When in 1989, Algeria uh, renounced the single party regime, then accepted the multi-party system, the legalization of Islamist party happened, which was followed by a military conflict between the Islamist parties, armed forces, and the world society itself. There was for us only two options left, to resist or to abdicate. And many Algerians choose to resist and risk their lives for it. Women were at the front row. They were guilty of the basic facts of being women. The Islamic armed group, Jiyya, demanded that all women should wear the Islamic veil. It was literally the veil or death. And many Algerian women refused to wear it. Many got killed. This is why I developed a deep repulsion for all kind of Islamic veil, no matter if they are small or large, or partially covering the the, the face or the body. I left Algeria in 1994 because of death sentence pronounced by a group called FIDA, which targeted my whole family. My mom and dad were both intellectual who committed themselves into social and political struggles. So, as thousands of our fellow Algerians did during those times, we took the path of exile and we landed in France. To me, France was no stranger country. I know this country's language and culture and I was familiar with uh, its codes. But I was up to a huge surprise when right after we had settled in Saint-Denis in Paris, not uh, suburban, I found out there were in that very area many Islamist circles which were not subject to the government rule. Were there similarity between the Algerian situation and uh, one and uh, what I witnessed in France? Certainly so. The Algerian Islamists found in Western democracies protective regimes that offered them a second chance. The very chance they themselves denied to those who fought for democracy in Algeria. Algerian Islamist group became bigger than bigger in all Europe, as did the Muslim Brotherhood during the 60s. Terrorists attacked France as soon as 1995 and were perpetrated by dynamic and well-organized terrorist groups. Yet, some people within the political left found ways to excuse and to justify the terrorists. 
and rather blamed France colonialism or the Algerian government and militaries or bad social conditions and so forth. So for that regressive left, the guilty as not the real guilty and the victim as not the real victim. The victims become the guilty. This was the beginning of a tremendous mis, uh, misunderstanding, which lasted since then and which keeps growing. And cultural relativism keeps gaining ground. Confusion settles down into minds. Many amongst those whose profession and jobs is to resist to Islamist totalitarianism, I mean the academic and journalist, became Islamist friend. As for politicians, most of them are motivated by two things, money and re-election. When we realize the many diplomatic opportunities and possibility of Saudi Arabia, Iran, Qatar, uh, and, and others can get thanks to their textbooks, we can guess as well the degree of the penetration of Islamism into our democracies. In Canada, where I live since two decades, things got even worse, especially since the election almost two years ago of Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister. That means is so closed with the Islamists, then he even openly support them, especially the Muslim Brotherhood's organizations like the Islamic Society of North America, which incidentally published a kind of victory statement the very evening Trudeau won the last federal election. The official press release can be easily found on the internet. And one of the first political acts that was made by Trudeau as the new Premier Minister was to have his Minister of Justice to call a woman who previously won a legal battle, she fought for the right to wear the niqab at her citizenship swearing ceremony. Since then, Trudeau keeps favoring the Muslim Brotherhood and other Islamists in any way he can. And for this, he uses the mighty means of the Canadian government. For example, he appointed a parliamentary secretary of foreign affairs as a member of parliament who is very close, if not a full member of the Muslim Brotherhood. So my friends, this is how Canada is now led by that shiny but not bright superstar of the world's media system called Justin Trudeau. So when I told you at the beginning of this speech that we are in a pretty bad shape, maybe that uh, thought was influenced directly by what witness uh, on a daily basis in Canada. Um, just to, to, the, to conclude, uh, those are a few things I wanted to share with you. You will certainly understand how huge our task can be. But I know I can count on all of you to block the way to Islamofascism. As all of you, I will do my best to make this possible. Together we should convince more and more uh, citizens, not matter where they are. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jamila. Thank you.